Uh, welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. I'm gonna to be demonstrating how I created this landscape using thick paint and some thick paint compatible brushes in Painter 2021. And I have to say thick paints become my favorite medium to work with, so I'm actually really excited to share some of these techniques because uh, this is gonna be the first time you've ever seen some of this stuff. So this is the finished painting. What I'm gonna do is just kind of go through my process and try to explain a few of the steps along the way. But where I started with this, as I do with many of my paintings, is just with a simple sketch. And I did that on a separate layer. This is a 8x10 canvas at 150 ppi. It's kind of small, but that's just because I want to be able to paint quickly for this demonstration. Uh, you could use the real 2B pencil for this sketch here. I used my own custom brush. And jumping ahead a bit, really what I do is I just kind of block in each individual object. So I think about how things are layered in my scene from background to foreground. And then I create a layer for each of those objects. So we have the sky as a layer and the water in the foreground. And you could break this down as much as you want. But by doing this, it helps you kind of envision all the different objects in your scene before you start painting but then you also have the advantage of having everything on a layer so you can paint only the trees in the foreground or only the trees in the distance and so on and you'll you'll see why that's important a little bit later so how i got to this point i will just demonstrate real quick so let's delete these trees here and these are all thick paint layers as you may have noticed and thick paint layers of course, can be used with thick paint brushes, but they can now be used with thick paint compatible brushes. And a lot of the brushes in Corel Painter can be thick paint compatible, even by default. In the brush selector, you can see down on the bottom the new compatibility icons, and those will show you which of your brushes are thick paint compatible. So many of the brushes I'm using today are gonna to be custom brushes, but you could very easily go through and find brushes that make similar effects. Um, these brushes are available on my Patreon, which you can get connected through, to through my website, AaronRutten.com. So I'm going to start with Broken Paint. This is a thick paint brush. I'm using the Wacom Art Pen so I can rotate the angle of the dab, which can be very helpful. And I'll select this dark blue. I've just kind of made a palette ahead of time so I don't have to spend too much time here messing around with picking colors. Now, this brush will give you a different look depending on the paper grain you have selected. So I have some looks open here, and these looks will change that paper grain for me. Or give me an issue here. So hold on a second. Sorry about that. How about we do some questions? <laughs> <laughs> sure. OK. Um, let's see here. Would you please explain what you mean by a thick paint brush? Sure. So a thick paint brush is a specific media or brush technology in Corel Painter. And I'll, I'll have my document up here in just a second. Um, so the, the paint in thick paint doesn't actually look very thick right now because I've intentionally made all of these layers without any thickness, but if I take this uh, tree in the foreground here and I increase the visible depth, you can see that is some thick paint. So thick paint has a thickness to it that you can change on the fly, just like you can change the opacity of a layer, you can change the visible depth. And if you wanted it to be really thick, you could have it be thick. But it also has a particular behavior that is different than a lot of the other brushes that could give you flat paint like this. So there, there's a lot of advantages to working this way. Like if I take a color and blend into it, it looks a little bit different and feels a little bit different than some of the other brushes. So it has a, a feel that I really like. Um, I'll use the thickness sparingly. And you know, if I wanted to do a completely thick painting, I could, but I use it just kind of strategically. So to do that again, I have my brush here. I did not like that I selected a look for whatever reason, but like I was telling Tanya, if you don't have technical difficulties, you're not doing a webinar. So all I'm really doing is just kind of little circular strokes like this. Painting in here, not thinking too much about it. And when I use lighter pressure, I get more of that texture. 
Uh, Bob Ross or Bill Alexander would say that's the paint breaking on the canvas. If you press more firmly, then you don't get as much of that break. So you can kind of vary your pen pressure and change the angle of your pen and get these really nice tree patterns. And of course, I could change that paper to something else. And now I get a, you know, a slightly different texture. So I'm just kind of showing you the, the technique there and then we'll skip around. Um, basically the same thing for the background trees. You know, I'm just letting the brush do the work. I use the same brush for the foreground. Um, you might notice in the grass down here in the foreground, there's a little bit of green and a little bit of yellow and so on. I'm getting that effect or that mixture of paint by using the color variability. So it's just varying the color a little bit. That helps the paint not look so flat. Um, additionally, you might be wondering, what is this weird triangle here? This is a color gamut mask, and this is something that I've manually added into my mixer. You can import all sorts of images into your mixer, and this is just a tool that I use to select the colors in my painting. So it narrows down my color choices to something that looks harmonious. So I can't use any of the colors outside of this gamut. So let's say if I wanted to add some pink flowers, which we'll do later, this is the brightest pink that I can choose if I want it to be within this gamut. So won't go into too much detail on how to do that. I have a, I have a tutorial video on YouTube you can watch, but I've been using color gamut masking a lot lately. So after I've kind of blocked in everything here, I can skip ahead to the next version. And here I've kind of just put in some different shapes here for the tree, so, and the sky as well. So the way that I did this is, let's clear this out here. When you have so many layers, it can be difficult to figure out where all your layers are sometimes, but I try to have them nice and labeled and organized and that doesn't make it too difficult. I can turn on preserve transparency, just fill that in there with a color, which I think we want this one here. And I can choose some different greens. And right now I've actually flattened this layer down to, a, or not flattened it down, but I've converted it to a default layer. So let's just make it thick paint again so that it's how it should be. And with preserved transparency enabled, I can then paint some colors into this. Now, what I want to do is rather than paint into the shape, I actually want to go ahead and just duplicate that because this particular brush erodes the paint. And I could go through and I could add some detail to it to kind of thicken it up. Put some different colors on it like this. I'm just being kind of quick and sloppy here just to kind of show you how you can keep the paint trapped inside of there. Or you can add additional thick paint layers. So if I do that, I'll turn off preserve transparency and I can select maybe a brighter color like this and put in some leaves on the tree. If I wanna keep the paint trapped within that silhouette that I've already created, I can right click on that shape and then choose select layer content. That just puts a selection around that layer. And if I hide that selection with control shift H, go back to my new layer that I'm painting on and you can see I won't be able to paint off of that shape. So works kind of like a stencil. You could go through, pick some various colors here if you want it to look kind of like a fall time tree. Again, I'm being super sloppy about this and just really quick because I don't want to spend too much time painting the tree, but I did spend much more time than you see me doing here to paint on the tree. So we would then jump ahead to something like this where I've you know clearly spent more time and effort on this. And at this point, I've started to use the thick paint compatible brushes. So in order to use a thick paint compatible brush, you need to be painting on a thick paint layer. You don't have to put down thick paint first, uh, but in this case I did, and then I went through and blended over some of it. So let's see, the, some things have been merged down now. So let's go ahead and make this a thick paint layer. 
So you can see how this works. So if I use a brush that's not a thick paint brush, let's say this oily blender, this is just a regular brush, I can actually paint on this thick paint to smudge it around. And if we make the paint thicker, it's kind of subtle at this point because of the way I did it. But if I zoom in, you can see it has a bit of an edge and I can blend through it and so on. I'll add another layer and just make it intentionally really thick so you can see how, this, how the thick paint brush can cut through. Let's put down some really thick paint here. And I'll get that oily blender, which is not a thick paint brush, but is thick paint compatible. And you can see that I can interact with that thick paint and it's still thick paint. I don't have to convert it to a default layer. And if you're not getting, if you're not super technical with Painter and some of this sounds like gibberish to you, that's okay. These are kind of some more advanced things, but in layman's terms, you can just use thick paint with other brushes that you couldn't use them with before, which is great. Um, it's, you know, in older versions of Painter, you can't blend thick paint as easily. Now I can. Let's get rid of this candy bar. And on the tree's foreground layer, what I can do is now that I've kind of added some different layers of color and blended them up a little bit, now I'll add another layer. And let's just call this leaves thick so we know what it is. Now I can go through and I can use that broken paintbrush with a little bit of visible depth. And now I can create some leaves that kind of stick out. I want to make that a bit brighter. I can do that. And by using just a little bit here and there, I think that helps. You know, if I did the whole tree like this and it's super thick, it's just not, it's not going to look right. So this gives you that effect of maybe using a palette knife or something with traditional paint. And that's kind of what I'm going for in this particular scene. This is and you know it's supposed to look like it's kind of traditional and i really love these effects that you can get these palette knife effects i can even sample colors and just put them in like this but you can see the paint sticks together in a natural way it blends in a natural way it just it makes you feel like you're you're pushing around gloopy paint rather than pixels, and I like that. So I could go through and do something like that, and then if I want to, if it's too strong, I could go back to that oily blender, and I could blend it, and maybe use a bigger brush here, tap on it and kind of mash it back into the canvas so it's not so strong, and, you know, just spend a little bit, bit of time going back and forth and doing that. I didn't, for this particular piece, I didn't put in the tree and it was instantly the way I wanted it to be. I actually had to go through a few times and get it looking the way I want. And that's the beauty of working with digital art is, you know, I can take that tree and just get rid of it and start over and I don't have to repaint the background or any of the other stuff that I put in. So in the foreground here, I've started to put in these reeds. These are on a separate layer. And for that, I used this thick grass blades. This is just kind of a, a vertical, long vertical dab. And by rotating the angle of my Wacom art pen, I'll make this really bright so you can see, I can kind of change the angle of those grass blades. Now you might wonder why even bother using this brush why wouldn't you just, you know, use a, a pen or a pencil or something and put it in? The reason why is because this brush has just a little bit of a regularity to it. It's not completely perfect, and I, I like that. I can also turn it horizontally, and I can pull up some things that look like grass blades, which is normally how I use this brush. I don't always know what brush I'm going to use. Sometimes I just go in and today I feel like using this brush, but tomorrow I might feel like using another brush. Not hard for me because I have a million brushes here. And I've actually started to kind of pare down my brushes. I create brushes uh, almost every month, semi-monthly. And so I have a ton of brushes and at some point 
you can have too many brushes in your workspace. So what I've been doing is I've been installing brushes in kind of a modular way. I'll have box files of brushes and then I can load those. If I'm gonna do paint, uh, fire painting or space painting, I'll have my fire pack or my space pack and then I'll paint with those. And then when I'm done with them, I'll remove them from my workspace. So all I'm really doing here, again, I'm being quicker than I normally would be just for example's sake, is just putting in millions and millions of reads here. There's no secret to it. You could make a brush that creates more than one stroke, such as an image shows nozzle, and that would make short work of this. But sometimes it does feel kind of satisfying to go in here and just draw a million different blades. You know, it, I think if you do everything with brushes that do all the work for you, sometimes you don't feel like you're really painting. You're just kind of, you know, applying graphics to the canvas. So some people might think this is really tedious, but I kind of enjoy it. I'm being careful not to go outside of my color gamut. So while I could be tempted to go in here and get a super bright color like this and put it in, it might not quite fit into my scene in the way I want it to. So the, the greens are intentionally a little bit dull here because I, I want this to look kind of subdued in that regard. So if I jump ahead a bit more, actually, and before I do that, let's look at the flowers too. We don't wanna leave out the flowers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if I'm gonna pick a pink, my range of pink is limited. So while I could put in a bright pink like this, it doesn't fit in. You know, it's like, it's way too bright, pops out way too much. But if I choose this as my brightest pink and I put that in, it feels pretty bright compared to the colors around it, but as you can see, it's not very saturated. So for these, I don't mind if there's a little bit of visible depth for these flowers, that looks kind of good. And I can just put in those. Again, I'm using that broken paint brush. There's a broken paint, which has a little bit of color variability, which you may or may not be able to see. And then there's broken paint flat, which is the same brush but it has less color variability. So if you find that the color variability is shifting your color too much and you're going outside of the range of colors you want, using the flat version of this works better. So at this point, this is kind of a maybe a halfway point here. I think it might be a good time to answer a few questions you might have. Okay, <laughs> I have a lot more coming in now, um, but starting at the top, there was somebody wondering which brush icon you're using. Which Is brush icon? The, the standard brush ghost, the enhanced, do you uh, know? For the, for the cursor, um, yeah. I, I am using the enhanced brush ghost. That's what I then, thought. And then um, normally you would be able to, to check or uncheck show icon when painting. So if I check that, then when I paint with this brush, all I see is this little crosshair. I find that this is useful if you're using a pen or a pencil or a very thin brush, but I actually like to have the diameter of the cursor showing. So I uncheck that. And then I can always see the width of that dab, which I feel is, is helpful feedback for a lot of brushes. Some brushes yeah. you'll you'll maybe paint with the edge of the brush and not the center of it, and so it, it can be good to see. Um, I can tell that you're using an art pen. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. <laughs> so there are some questions just about why would I want to use an art pen, and it was also asked which tablet you're using. Okay, you got to you got to ask yourself why wouldn't you use an art pen, and. I think the art pen is, is something that every Corel Painter user should have. I know not everybody has a tablet that supports it, but at first it's like, okay, cool, you can you can rotate your pen. But if you try it, you can see that, let's say I wanna paint water splashing, I can get a more dynamic shape with this. you know. Or if I wanna do tree trunks, there's my thin tree trunks, there's my wide tree trunk. I don't have to go through and change my brush size. So, it feels very natural when you're using flat brushes to be able to, to turn the dab. You can do that with traditional media. If you have a, a flat brush in real life, you can rotate it. You should be able to do that digitally too. 
um, if you do line art with solid fills, you don't really need the Wacom art pen because you're not going to be rotating your dab. This is probably more useful for you know people who are doing more like fine art and things like that. Um, the tablet I'm using is the Cintiq 27 QHD Touch. I think it's still one of the best tablets out there as far as the the big Cintiqs. Um, the art pen is supported on the Cintiqs and the Intuos Pro. Um, and even some of the, the newer kind of lower end Cintiqs like the Cintiq 22 and 16 also support the art pen. So you can make it compatible with quite a few tablets. Okay, cool. Um, there's a couple questions about color gamut. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking here. What process steps did you go through to create your color gamut? I think, um, I don't know, some people just, it maybe that portion went a little too fast for them to grasp. Sure. If you could just recap. Uh, un understandably so. It's kind of a, kind of a separate topic, but, um, yeah. so I have uh, a tutorial you can watch if you want the, the long explanation, but I'll kind of give you just a concise version here. So I have a template that I've created. And this is a urine B color wheel. This is uh, a technique that's been championed by uh, lots of other artists. And so this is something that uh, James Gurney uses a lot for his traditional paintings, as well as lots of other artists. And it looks a lot like your regular color wheel. Yellow on top, blue on bottom, same orientation for the hues. Um, but what I can do here then is I can go into my gamut masks and I could choose a complementary mask or a triangular mask. So these are kind of based on, um, you know, complementary colors are a method of choosing color based on color theory. You can explore some of those in the harmonies. We have the complementary harmonies. So if I choose yellow, then you can see the complementary is blue. So you can learn about those using the harmonies panel. These are just based off of this. And then the principle here is if you choose a range of colors, those colors are always going to look harmonious. And if you don't choose colors outside of that range, you can, can maintain that. Um, a good analogy, which probably a lot of people won't understand because they're not video editors, is color grading. When you watch a movie, let's say Lord of the Rings and everything looks kind of cold and blue and everybody has a blue tone to them, that's kind of like a gamut mask there's certain colors that just aren't shown in the image. So it's it's kind of a technical thing. Again, you, you will, you'll wanna watch my other videos on it, but long story short, it's just a way to limit your colors and it ends up making for some pretty cool looking paintings. That is very cool. Okay, so everybody go watch this. It's on YouTube, your YouTube channel, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. you, could just, you could just search for, for Gamut Mask. And also, uh, like I said, James Gurney is he's he's the man when it comes to this stuff. So he has lots and lots of resources for this. I'm just kind of more or less getting into it and figuring out how it can be useful for my technique. But it's a it's a really great way of picking color. Okay, and I have one more, and then I'll let you move on. Sure. Um, sure. There's interest, and I know this might be too in depth, but we see that you have the um, the dabs with the names in your palettes over there. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's hard to create for somebody that might want the dab with the name attached? Um, it's pretty easy. I actually have a template that's available on my Patreon, but anybody could do this. You could just make a little square icon. Again, I have my my templates here, so brush icons. You're so prepared. I'm, I'm like the biggest curl painter nerd that there is, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my template. Uh, so, <laughs> but you know, it's when you, when you do this stuff so much, templates are a great thing. You're working on a computer, why not use some of these things? So this is just a text layer. I can go through, change the text using the text tool, uh, change the image that's on its own layer. And so I just select the brush and and paint on it and then I have my icon and then I just do a save as to save it as you know the same name that I've given the brush and then I have icons for each brush you click on the icon and you choose set custom icon and you can choose that, that file so the reason why I do that is because 
how you would use a brush is very subjective. Some brushes, like the particle brushes, you could use in a hundred different ways and get a hundred different looks. So because we're all using brushes in a certain way, um, the stroke preview can be helpful and the dab preview can be helpful, but if you don't use the brush that way, then it's not necessarily, you, know, you can't look at that and intuitively know that that's the brush you want. For me, I can, I can at least make a dab or a stroke and kind of show my intention for that brush. But because I have so many brushes, it does make it difficult to go in here and know that, you know, one brush is going to do one thing and one's going to do something else. So that's why these little abbreviations are here. That way I can see that this one's a grainy blender, this one's greasy blender. And to be honest, a lot of these brushes do kind of the same thing, but you know, the looks are different enough to where I might occasionally want greasy blender. But as you saw in this, this painting that I was doing, uh, I've only used a handful of brushes. I haven't used very many. And that's typical for most of my paintings. Uh, a lot of these brushes might be specialty brushes where I might want a very specific look for painting a nebula or snake skin or something like that. And I lied because I have one more question that's been sure. asked twice now. So Brandon is wondering, can a water brush work on thick paint to add details? Uh, it can in a sense. So we could create a watercolor brush or a watercolor layer. And I can get to the bottom of my palette here. <laughs> And while you're doing that, I forgot to tell everybody, we are recording this. A lot of people are asking. Yes, we are. And I will post this up later this afternoon on YouTube. Yeah, and I'm going a little bit fast here. I, I don't expect that anyone's going to like be able to actually follow along step by step. But I have a lot of videos and training courses that go through this stuff a lot more slowly. Um, so this is a watercolor brush on a watercolor layer. and. If I wanted to, I could put down some watercolor. Now that watercolor is on its own separate layer, so it's not going to interact with a thick paint in the same way that a thick paint brush or a thick paint compatible brush would. Um, however, if I wanted to, let's see where that layer is for the tree. I could right click on this tree's layer and I can convert it to a watercolor layer. Now, because watercolor is a transparent medium, it's going to blend differently with the background and it obviously changes the appearance. Um, there's some things I could do to compensate for that. But just for example's sake, I'll just show you that I can take watercolor and diffuse it into that and paint into that tree as if the paint that I put down is now watercolor. So that's a couple of different ways you could do that. Another thing that you could do is with your thick paint, either as a default layer or a thick paint layer, you could select just add water, which is a default blender. And you could blend the thick paint in a way that gives the illusion that it's wet. So it might start out thick and then I'll just go over it lightly to where I'm not blending everything out. And if I do that, it almost has a watercolor appearance now. I do it the right way. Thanks, Aaron. That's great. They're impressed by how much you know. <laughs> well, I've been I've been working with this for a long time, and that's you know that's how I spend most of my time is making digital art. So you, that's kind of the the best way to learn is just to keep doing something. Everybody kind of wants like a like a quick fix and a, I'm like that too, you know, like I want to learn guitar and it'd be great if I could just watch one video or, you know, take take a couple lessons. But it's just one of those things you have to stick to it for a long time and then you learn all those different tricks. Um, spending some time developing your own techniques, I think, can be helpful too because there's so much you can do with Curl Painter and just digital art in general that it's hard to find the way of making art you know this is my way of making art and it might not work for everybody it might be really overly complicated and confusing but for me it works and so you don't have to use a million layers and a million brushes and custom icons and all that you could open painter and just start working with the default brushes and 
make something that probably looks exactly the same without all the different steps. But for me, as you saw, you know, I like to use templates and, and layers and all this stuff. It takes the stress out of art for me because then I know if I put these flowers down and I don't like them, I can get rid of them. And then I don't have to stress about putting them down. For me, working with traditional media, it, there's a lot of anxiety involved with it. You know, I've, I don't know how many times I'd be working on a drawing or a painting and smudge it with my hand or spill something on it, you know, find out there's a hair stuck in it that I can't get out. So with using all these layers and, and all these safeguards, I can paint without having as much anxiety, if any at all. Uh, so at this point, this is like my, you know, almost finished state, kind of getting to the point to where I don't know what else I want to add to it. And that's how I know I'm almost done. <laughs> Uh, so you may notice that I've added a warm overlay layer and that just has a mask on it so it fades kind of from the right to the left so it's warmer over on the right of the canvas. I like to do this sometimes because it just uh, it's a nice effect it changes the colors and if I've been looking at a painting for a long time I, I kind of get fatigued by it I'm like eh I don't like those colors or you know if I add a overlay layer to it then it kind of changes it a bit and so I feel invigorated again also uh, what can help with that is to flip your canvas horizontally and then all of a sudden it's like a fresh painting you know the, you might not want to do this for certain things like a city that has a billboard with writing on it because then the writing would be backwards but for landscapes and things like that there's no problem doing this and then I might find that I actually like it better flipped like this then I look at it again I go, nope, actually, I like it better this way. And so uh, I like to work that way. I eventually decided I think I like it this way better. <laughs> um, I also use a layer that's filled with black and set to the color composite method just to check the value structure in this painting. So in general, things that are in the background should be lighter than things in the foreground to give the illusion of distance. Oh, it's you know doesn't mean that like the grass here has to be black because this stuff is dark it's just kind of a way to get an idea of the relative values this isn't technically 100 percent accurate it does um, change the colors a little bit but for the most part it gives you an idea of what the relative value is in your piece so that's another way just to kind of double check your work and if you need to tweak a layer you can always adjust it and make it lighter or darker you know, I could select the reeds in the foreground, go to effects, tonal control, adjust colors, and you know, if I want to, I can darken and lighten them that way without having to repaint them. And at this point, it's just, it's adding a lot of little stuff. You, you know, you saw I started kind of big with big blocky shapes, added a few kind of medium shapes on top of that, and now I'm doing a lot of the little stuff with small brushes. So we'll skip ahead to the final version. And this is where I just brought the painting together. Um, a lot of the same kind of stuff that you saw me doing with the, the same brushes and blenders. But this time what I did is I did a, a copy merged, which just takes all of your layers and merges them into a single layer that's a copy. I'll show you how to do that with one of these other examples here. Got so many documents open now. <laughs> um, so to do that, I won't count my overlay as, as part of this because I want that to remain separate. But I could select my topmost layer, do a select all, and then copy merged. And then what that ends up doing is that puts everything onto a separate layer. It's all merged together and then I'll have all of my layers still intact if I ever want to get to them. You know, like I might, for whatever reason, want to try to select one of those areas again, but everything is just merged down into a single layer. Then I added more layers on top of that of just little things, like little tree de little tree details, like the branches here, some more little flowers. Because I know I'm probably not going to go back and do any major changes to any of those other layers that I have. I'm just trying to enhance what I have here. And then I grouped my effects together. I added a little bit of a vignette. And it's really just kind of the icing on top of the cake at this point, getting it looking the way I want. And 
when I get tired of working on it, then I know I'm done. <laughs> so for example, on this merged layer, I can show you'll use the oily blender. I just kind of, you know, push the tree edges around, get it looking like the shape that I want. And there's not necessarily like a right or wrong way to do it. I'm not necessarily going off of a reference every time I paint. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But you just use your artistic judgment here. And if it looks right to you, go, go for it. You could use composition tools if you wanted to, to compose this and decide, you know, scientifically it looks best if it has this curve to it and this arrangement and stuff like that. But a lot of the times you can just paint and just let your mind wander and not think too much about it. All I'm really doing is just tapping on the tree. And if I decide I don't like that little smudge I made, I'll do an undo, try another smudge. Um, so that pretty much covers it technique wise. I'm happy to answer more questions if there are any. Yeah, sure. Um, there was a question about color variability and I just wonder, um, does that work with every brush and can you point out if they didn't have it open by default because it's not a part of the default layout how do you locate that sure so we can find that under the window menu you can find everything under the window menu and then i believe it's hiding in brush control panels and then it's considered to be brush media. So if you're having trouble finding stuff, the best way to find it is to think about whether or not it affects the shape of the brush or what comes out of the brush. So paint is what comes out of the brush, so it's gonna be media. And there's color variability. Um, this is a, a really fun tool that we can use. So let's experiment with it a bit here. I'll add a new thick paint layer. And I'll use that broken paint brush first because that has some color variability. Now, if I paint a stroke with this, you can see within that stroke, it's a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. And I have 4% hue variability. Hue is the hue ring. So a small amount of variability would just make the hue ring move a little bit like this, whereas a large amount of hue variability would make it move a lot. And then value is the lightness and darkness of a color on this axis here in the color picker. And then the saturation is on the horizontal axis. That's the intensity of the color. So you can vary each of those or all three together. And then you can even smooth it out to create different patterns. So if I add a little bit of smoothness, then each stroke I make is a little bit different. This is gonna affect different brushes in different ways, but the two basic ways of working is either it's gonna blend the color together in kind of a marbled pattern, or it's going to change the color with each stroke. Uh, but with this brush, it gives me that nice marbled paint, which adds a lot of life to your paint, and you might wanna mix colors that way traditionally, so this does a good way of simulating that. Um, you can also, from the mixer, you can also sample multiple colors. So I could, let's say, put down some black and then some white. Then I can use sample multiple colors in the mixer, choose a sample size here, and then click in between two colors. And now I have a brush that's loaded with two colors. And because I'm using that Wacom Art Pen, I can also rotate the barrel of the pen to put the black and the white on the opposite sides now. So that's yet another reason why the art pen is awesome. You know, if you're painting tree trunks, you might want to have the shadows on one side or on the other side. Aaron, that was such a good explanation. Thank you. <laughs> you're making me realize some things here. Uh, let's see, Helen was wondering, can you use similar medium as you would, for example, in acrylic painting such as string gel and granular medium? I'm not familiar with those. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either. Um, okay. This was the question whether or not those could be mixed into this thick paint? I think the question is, 
do they exist in painter i mean we strive to emulate traditional media as closely as we can and there are different variants that do different things so it might be in there yeah, um, what, but what, how, were the, what were the names of them again it was called string gel and granular medium granular medium i i would have to see examples of those but just based on how you describe that um there's there's lots of different effects that you can get like for granular stuff you know of course you can change your paper texture let's say to sandy pastel paper and then i need a brush that's a bit different here you can get some effects that look kind of kind of grainy let me zoom into that so yeah. if you're looking for something that looks kind of granular you know it's it's really easy to get all kinds of different textures and there's a number of ways to do that if you wanted something stringy, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know that I have a brush off the top of my head that can do that, but you could make individual bristles on a brush spread out more and have something that looks a little bit stringier, like individual lines of paint, or perhaps uh, so, even. Sorry. Or, Mandy piped in and said maybe she thinks that the FX gradient brush would be like string gel. I don't know, but just a, a throw out from the audience here. Oh, Helen said yes, that's the granular effect she was looking for. We have to create a layer for this. Um, depends on the gradient that you have selected, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, this is actually, I have a similar brush to this. I just call it cylinder pen, but the gradient that you select determines the colors that you're that are in your string here. So that is one way you could do it for sure. Okay, great. Lots of different ways <laughs> to get effects. Yeah. Um, let's see and i can't tell in your layer uh oh oh boy a lot of questions coming in um sorry guys when you add questions in it bumps the one i was looking at out uh, oh is do you have a in your warm overlay layer are you using a gradient i am using a mask which essentially creates a gradient so i'll, I'll show you how i did that overlay real quick so I'll just delete that overlay and I'll create a new default layer and I can pick a color that I want to choose I think I use just kind of a warm color like this and I will fill with that now normally this is just going to cover the layer underneath but if you change the composite method to overlay then you get something that changes the color a little bit and you could play with that color and reduce the opacity of it or choose different shades of it and so on. So I'll just do something warm like that. And then if I want to essentially make kind of a gradient out of it, what I'll do is I'll add a layer mask. A layer masking is something that does kind of require its own explanation, but essentially what it's going to do is it's going to conceal pixels in one area and reveal them in others. So it just kind of hides pixels when you paint over them. And I could use a gradient to create my mask. I have a gradient that goes from black to white, and I'll just choose that preset so that happens. And then I can, oops, that one's not white, that one's, there we go. So I can create kind of a mask that goes from black to white, which gives me the same effect. It might be kind of hard to see exactly what I'm doing here. So let's try this. So I'm still in that mask. And I'll change it to the radial mode. So you can see where it where it's white, you can see that layer, and then it starts to kind of become more and more invisible as I'm adding black to it. So in a sense, what I'm doing here, if this is the lighting, it's starting out over here and then it's fading out. And when I change this to overlay, then I get that effect. 
and you'll you'll see that sometimes you know if the sun's over here on the right and you're not looking directly at it it kind of washes out and tints some of the some of the colors so that's just kind of a maybe it's more of a photographic or photo editing effect but i like to add stuff like that same goes for the vignette you know that's more of a photographic effect and you don't you don't necessarily have to do this stuff it's just you know maybe this is just kind of something that's that defines my style but I like to add different effects like that. It makes a big difference when you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's a subtle change, but yeah, it has a big impact. Can you simply explain, I don't know how intense it's going to be, the, the de how did you achieve the details, reflections, and gradient in the water down there? Um, so let's see here. see if we can go back to one before I blended it. So in 14, number 14, I, I went up to about 18 iterations of this, not, not iterations, but uh, saves, iterative saves. Um, so this is the water in the foreground. That started out with a thick paint brush. I'll need to convert that to a thick paint layer. So that probably started out, oops. Well, there's there's some stuff on top of it, but I'll do my best to kind of communicate that. So if that just started out as something that's just using the colors from the sky, you know, I just had it just blocked in with whatever chunky, chunky paint like that. Um, then I went through it and I used the oily blender and I probably blended over it to give it some sharpness. And then I used the diffuse blur blender. I'll have to convert that to a default layer first. It may be kind of hard to see, but I'm holding shift and pulling straight down. And that's giving me kind of a, a blended effect. And you can hold shift and use lighter pressure to go straight across and kind of blend it out. It's very much like the Bob Ross technique for painting water. Now that's not exactly like, you know, the other example, because I just did it quickly, but that's essentially what I did is just put in some color and then just blended it. You let the blenders do the work. Is there a way to add paper texture after you're done with the painting? Sure. Um, we can add a new layer for that, call it texture, and make sure preserve transparency is turned off. And just like we added a, an overlay earlier, I'm going to get a very specific gray, which is 128 for the value, zero for hue, zero for saturation. And if I fill with that, and then I set the composite method to overlay, that color disappears. And then if I go to, uh, I want to choose my paper first. Uh, let's see, something appropriate for this old cotton canvas. Effects, surface control, apply surface texture. I could adjust the strength and these properties here, but I'm just going to go ahead and go with those settings and I'll reduce the opacity of that layer until I get something that's not too noticeable but just subtle enough to look like real texture and then if you want it to look natural you probably don't want to have an even texture over the whole painting so you could use a layer mask and select something like a sponge and if i paint with black what i'm going to do is i'm going to remove some of that texture by masking it away it's going to be hard to see what i'm doing here so i'm just going to do it and then I'll zoom in. But if you can see my cursor, I'm just painting over the whole canvas and removing a little bit of that texture so that it's not so even. And now if I zoom in, I don't really have a before and after to show you, but you can see the texture appears in some areas and then in other areas it doesn't. It just looks more natural that way. 
And then in areas where the paint's thicker, if you were going to paint with texture and use thick paint, you probably would want to put your thickest thick paint on top of that texture or go through and mask it away in those areas because if the paint's really thick, you won't be able to see the texture. Um, you could even add additional layers of texture as well if I wanted to add another layer. Use that same overlay composite method and that same middle gray color. And I can pick a different paper texture, let's say artist rough paper. Apply the surface texture again. Reduce the opacity of it. Add a mask to it. And I'm just using just kind of a any chunky looking captured brush would work well for this. I'm just painting over it to remove some of that. And I think a couple layers of texture that are both masked and are pretty subtle tends to look pretty good. If you just use one solid flat texture, it looks like an effect. It doesn't look like a texture. Like it doesn't look like it's part of the painting. So I'll use them sometimes, but you can also imply texture using the brushes. You don't necessarily have to, uh, to put one over the canvas. But then the advantage to having these now on separate layers is let's say you, you go to print this on a canvas, you go to you know, a print shop and you say, I want this printed onto canvas. You might wanna use the natural grain of that real canvas instead of your simulated grain here. So in that case, you can just hide those canvas layers or the texture layers and then print it without your simulated texture. Okay. I'm gonna to have to try some of those as well. And let's see, it, the questions have really slowed down. So if anybody has a burning question that you would like to have answered in the next few minutes, feel free to pop it in here. I think I've addressed most of them. Um, this one might go out of the realm of painter, but Laura is wondering if you're familiar with the Wacom 3D pen. Have you ever used that? Um, I haven't. That might, that's, I haven't well, that's either. one of the few that I haven't used, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't. Um, I, Laura... I, I believe it's one of the older ones, too. Well, it can be used in 3D and 2D, but um, I'll, I have never used it, so I'm not familiar with how it might apply in the 2D world. Um, so I can look into that one for you, Laura. Yeah, there's the, so there's the ProPen 3D, which is like a newer one. And I think essentially that just has an extra button, whereas most, most pens have two, that one has a third one. Yeah. Um, but there was also one that I believe had a similar name, which I might just be getting confused with. Do you ever have any issues with your art pen? Nope, I haven't had any issues with any Wacom pen. They work pretty reliably and you have to change the nibs now and then, but I'm drawing on a Cintiq, so it doesn't, you know, I, I rarely have to change a nib. Yeah, um, I also have never had an issue with my art pen. Yeah, I've heard that, you know, I've heard people say the nibs wear down really fast and that could just be technique or, you know, you you will see a slight amount of the nib wear away, but that doesn't mean that it's not usable or it's going to negatively affect your tablet. So a little bit of the nib wearing away is normal, but, you know, you definitely don't want it to wear down so far that you can't take it out and to replace it. Okay. Emma's wondering what your favorite feature of 2021 is. I would have to say the thick paint compatibility or the thick paint compatible brushes. Because as, yeah. I've, as I've shown you here, like all, most of the stuff I did, um, as far as blending and you know getting a lot of the different textures and stuff wouldn't have been possible. I would, I mean, if I would have done some workarounds and converted the thick paint layers to default layers, I could have gotten the same effect. But this just, to me, as somebody who uses thick paint a lot, feels like there were some restrictions that have now been lifted. And so I can do a lot, a lot more with the technology. Okay, um, Randy is wondering if you have painter beginner videos on your website or do you have any of those available? 
Absolutely. So my videos are kind of split into two general categories. One are my videos on YouTube, which are entirely free and cover all kinds of different beginners topics. Um, there isn't necessarily a beginner's video per se, but there's a, a playlist of videos. Um, if you go to youtube.com slash Aaron Rutten, everything's pretty well categorized there. But if you go to aaronrutten.com, I actually have a page that um, shows you like a table of contents with everything sorted by category. So that's a good way to find what you're looking for. Um, if you wanted a more intensive training, like if you want to go through the entire application um, and learn what all the features do, or at least the ones that I find essential to my technique, uh, then I have courses that you can purchase, which are also available on my website. And like I said, those go through all the features of Curl Painter. You know, you'd learn all about thick paint, how to make thick paint brushes. And then at the end of the course, I show you how to make an example painting so that it's not just me going through menus and showing you features. I'm actually showing you how to turn that into something like art. Okay, perfect. Um, could this be instantly changed into a night scene? Your painting. It, is this a challenge? Art, <laughs> art challenge. Okay. I guess I'm, so. I'm down with an art challenge. Boom! <laughs> night scene. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's, let's let's put a moon in there too. <laughs> that was pretty instant, Helen. Um. Aaron is wondering if you feel that 2021 is the most stable version that you've worked with. Uh, I would say so. Um, you know, occasionally I'll get crashes here and there, and I don't know that those are necessarily the fault of Curl Painter. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I selected a look and had a crash there, but normally when I'm painting, it's it's pretty stable. Um, usually, if I get crashes, it's like when I'm live streaming, and that's because I'm running the live streaming software and Corella Painter, and my computer doesn't like that. Yeah, I mean, that's always a challenge. Even with GoToMeeting, the more apps you have open, the more you're taking away from Painter. Yeah. It's just the way technology works. Uh, cool. Let's see oh. here. Have you ever used a felt nib, or do you, in your pen? I've used them to see what they feel like, but um, I'm fine with just the regular nibs. Uh, they, you know, felt nibs do have like an aesthetic quality to them, but I don't know that it necessarily, you know, there there isn't really much of a reason to use it other than that. If you use mostly markers, you might expect to hear that kind of kind of squeaky noise depending on the tablet you're drawing on, and it has, you know, a bit more tooth to it. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm fine with the regular the regular nibs. Um, okay, two more, and then I'm going to have to cut it off, and I think we're we're at the end here. We've addressed everybody's questions because it's 1 o'clock. Um, let's see. Do you have any recommendations for where to get your artwork printed? And, I mean, cost is relative to size, so that's, uh, that's a hard yeah. one. Yeah, printing is a tricky thing. Like, I don't tend to print very much stuff, so I'm not what – would be considered like a print snob where I have to have very specific paper and inks and all that stuff. Um, I would go to like Costco or something because they do they do decent prints. You, know, you might laugh at that and say that they're not professional printers, but they have the, the machinery required to do large format prints and it's reasonably priced. Um, if you're just printing for yourself or maybe even to sell to people, as, as long as you are able to make your print look the way it should once it's printed on canvas by maybe editing the, the image and so on, that should be fine. If, you're, if your thing is like, you know, I only print on ar archival quality canvas, blah, 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 then you're gonna have to spend a lot more money and, you know, probably go to like a more professional print shop. Um, but everything I've printed falls into that former category where I'm just printing from Costco or, you know, wherever I can. Um, Paul chimed in and said Canvas Pop is incredible, so that's another option. And here's our last question. Bob would like to know more about your Patreon program. Sure. Um, so Patreon is a subscription to uh, the different content that I create. Um, first and foremost, it supports 
the content that I create for free and you know it keeps me doing what I'm doing. Um, but then as my patron, you can get access to members only content. Uh, that would include this workspace here and all of these brushes. You could install just the workspace and have exactly what you see here on your computer. Or if you wanted to integrate specific things into your own workspace, like specific brushes or this color gamut masking tool, you can pick those out of my Dropbox. Um, I also have early releases of videos, uh, discounts on my courses, and lots of other things. If you go to my website, aaronrutten.com, you can actually um, get a pretty detailed breakdown of what Patreon has to offer. But there's, I, right. bet, I, I bet there's a lot of patrons on here watching now, and if there are, feel free to, to chime in and let us know what you think. Awesome. Well, um, this was a very comprehensive session. I'm going to have to watch it back again to remember all the tips that you provided, but there was some really good stuff in here. So thank you so much, Aaron. And thanks to everybody who joined us today. We did record this. Um, it takes a little while to process, but I'll let it do that and then I'll pop it up on YouTube. And we'll also send you a link tomorrow to the session with a, um, a special discount code as well. Don't forget to go to AaronRutten.com to check out everything that he offers. So with that, Aaron, is there anything else that you'd like to no, Same. just like to thank you and to thank everybody for watching. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to go ahead and close everything down here. Thanks again, Aaron. Bye, everyone. Bye.